All right, so um, announcements. Uh, so I uh, updated the, for their presentations, which are due uh, tomorrow, the upload of the presentations, that video um, is due to Canvas tomorrow. And originally it was due at five o'clock for some legacy reasons. And I realized it just doesn't make a lot of sense um, uh, because you're, I think gonna have enough peer review time on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to watch the one video. So in that case, I just pushed it to make it easier to 11.59 p.m. So upload your videos by 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday. And then at 11.59, Canvas will automatically randomly assign every student one video of another groups. And then that video you'll have until Saturday night to do a peer review. And the instructions for that are on Canvas, but basically you'll go into the presentation where you would have done your upload and you'll see a little uh, thing on the side that says peer review. You can click on that and you'll find your one uh, video or one assignment that has been assigned to you. You can of course see who that group is, but they won't be able to see who you are. So it's an anonymous peer review. Watch their video and there's a rubric. So there'll be a button that says show rubric. You can click on that and then you'll be able to say how well did they do in each of the categories in the rubric. And then I'd like you in the little comments field that also shows up there, just give them uh, a sentence or two or a couple of sentences or a whole paragraph. Um, that, uh, that just gives you some feedback that, that you had from based on you watching their presentation, things you liked, maybe things you didn't like, et cetera. And, um, and then all of that peer review, you know, make sure you click um, submit for in the, the rubric, there's like a save button or something like that and click submit and all of this is reminded of uh, online in the, in, the, in the presentation on Canvas. And then uh, I will then grade the peer reviews. And so I will see all the comments that you left and then everyone, who had comments left for them will see all those con comments um, anonymized. And then so I will then give everyone, if it looks like you put effort into the peer review, then you'll get uh, whatever the percentage point or something like that of your, your grade that the peer reviews is. And then I will look at everyone's peer reviews together and for each group, so for your group, I'll look at all the peer reviews that came in and then I'll also look at the group presentations and I'll aggregate all of those and that's how you'll get your presentation score. So that's how all the presentations will be handled. And that's the reason why presentations are due in the middle of the week. It gives, gives people a couple of days to do that peer review. Then your report will be due on Saturday. So that's um, the presentation stuff. Uh, Thursday is the final exam. And I think I actually have this timeline um, up here. So then um, the pre-take, which is just uh, final exam part one, uh, you don't have to take if you don't want to, uh, but if you do take it and you like your score, you don't have to take the final during finals week. So it's exactly like the midterm. The way it's set up, and I've already uh, put the final into Canvas, is that at um, Thursday, um, the you know, early morning, so late Wednesday night, um, and I'll answer a que that question, thanks Emily, in just a second. So Thursday, um, or Wednesday night, so going from Wednesday into Thursday, at midnight Wednesday night, Thursday morning, then the final exam will become available. And you'll have 24 hours to start the final exam, but you have to finish it um, before Friday at 10 a.m. And so, and then you'll, and I've given everybody 90 minutes. And so the idea was, is that I wanted to fit it within a class period, 75 minutes, but in case there are any technical snafus or anything like that, I wanted to provide a little extra time. So the little extra time isn't there because the exam's longer, it's just there to deal with any technical issues. And so that I added 15 minutes because normally you have 15 minutes between classes. So that's where I got 90 minutes. Uh, oh, and I see your hand, Brandy, I'll get to that in just a second. And, um, and then I also see the other question in the chat there. Um, and so, um, so then you'll, you'll finish the exam on Thursday, you'll get a score, all of the solutions will become available Friday at 10 a.m. And then from there, you can decide whether you want to take the retake. The retake will operate exactly like the pre-take did, but it'll be on Tuesday of finals week. So basically you'll have the whole 24 hours of Tuesday of finals week to start the exam. It'll have the same number of questions, be a very similar format, go over very similar content and similar difficulty, but it'll be a little different, just like the two midterms were different. 
I have updated online. I've put a blank copy of both of the midterms, um, just in case you wanted to retake the midterms without seeing the answers. There's all the midterm solutions, some uh, solutions is there as well. I put the final exam from last semester I taught this. I did not have a retake that semester, so that was designed for the full whatever 110 minute period. So the final exam sample and its solutions that are online are longer than what you would expect to see for the final exam here, because this final exam is designed for a normal class period, not a final exam period. All right, so that's the basics. Um, and I've seen there's a couple of questions. So um, uh, Emily, you said, uh, is the, the sheet typed or handwritten? Um, again, is, uh, this is just like the midterm. So as long as it is produced by you, if you would prefer typing it, I'm OK with typing. But when you show me the, um, the sheet in the lockdown browser with monitor, I, I don't want to see any photocopies of assignments or anything like that. Um, so I'm basically I'm giving you this formula sheet, but you have to produce it yourself. So you have to go through the effort of either typing it or writing it. You can't just copy and paste. Um, and then, um, and I see uh, William's got a question, but before that I saw Brandy, I think, um, had a hand up. Yes, I did. Um, uh -huh. So my question is, you said that you'll have 24 hours to start it, but I'm assuming once you start the exam, there's no exiting out of it and coming back to it, correct? It is my impression that on Canvas, and I can try to double check this, but it's, it's sometimes it's hard to wade through the instructions, but um, when I've tested this myself, if you do happen to like have your browser crash, I think you can go back into it um, just so long as you go back into it within that period. So it doesn't, uh, your clock keeps going um, and so it's still available for you but um, you so so like let's say there's um you know you, you close out of your browser and you don't come and you reopen your browser you should still have access to the exam but if it took you five minutes to close out your browser and restart it then five minutes will be off your clock that's the way i intended it for and i think that's the way it works on canvas but i'll try to confirm that but um, just to be safe, it's good to try to do it all in one browser sitting, but if something weird happens, then I think you should have access to it for that whole 90 minutes, even if you close your browser and reopen it. Okay, awesome, thank you. And then, um, and then I see a question, so um, uh, I have an issue with Lockdown Browser, I'm not familiar with how to use it and how it's working on multiple computers, can it be done on iPad, it said the admin would have to give permission. Um, I. I'm not sure if Lockdown Browser can work on an iPad because it's a separate application you'd have to download. Um, it is my impression that the only, I thought that Lockdown Browser, it's, it's a separate application that, so if you haven't done the, I, everybody but about four people have done the practice assignment that forces you to use Lockdown Browser once. Thanks for everybody who's doing that. If you haven't, go ahead and do that. If you do that, um, it forces you to download Lockdown Browser. And basically it'll give you a link, you download the browser, and then you just open the browser as if it was like a separate browser on your computer, like Chrome. And when you open it, it will basically bring you to ASU's Canvas, and it will be the only thing you can use. And so from there, you can click on the 212 link, you can click on modules, you can go down the final exam module, and you can go into the final exam. And then it'll actually let you open the final exam from that point. So, um, so I, I, I don't think you can do it on an iPad. If that is a problem, if you don't have access to a computer and, um, and you need to do the exam on an iPad, then there are contingencies that I can work out um, with, um, you know, with say proctoring over Zoom and some other things like that. I'd like to avoid those if possible to try to keep the experience as uniform. Uh, but if you absolutely are having problems with the practice assignment, then let me know ASAP. Um, uh, so you have to let me know before Thursday. Yeah, I'm actually having like a ton of problems right now. I don't know why. Um, I've downloaded the app and everything on multiple computers and it's just not having any compatibility. I think it's something that I can work through. What I see is that like the lockdown browser always crashes as soon as I get to Canvas. And then it doesn't allow me to take a practice exam, which I've been trying to do since last week. But that's something that I can probably work out with you in office hours so that I know how to properly use it. And so it's correctly downloaded for Thursday. Sure, that would end, like I said, if, if worse comes to worse, um, I can, you know, set up a time, maybe actually do, um, we can, I can, we can find a way to do something that, um, like I said, I can, I can do a proctoring via Zoom 
Um, the, due to some complications, there's a limit to how many people I could proctor simultaneously. Um, there's some, uh, some nice chat there about an app for downloading Lockdown if you want to use it on a tablet. So you might. Yeah, uh, you can do it on like a tablet, like iPad or something. And when I tried, it just essentially said that permission would just have to be given from the administrator so that you can take it on an iPad. I see. Yeah, I might. Um, I can go and look to see if I can turn on the tablet. I think I might have specifically left it the defaults with the tablet permission turned off. Because. Mm -hmm. um, it, but if it looks like that would help, I can try that. Um, okay. I think the problem with the tablet is that because of the positioning of the video on the tablet, it's difficult to keep your face in the frame. And yeah. a, lot of the, 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 yeah, a lot of the proctoring stuff is looking for your face. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I'd like to prefer to maybe not do that. So yeah, maybe we can work this out in office hours and come up with a solution that works. But we should definitely uh, tackle that ASAP. Perfect. Thank and you. then, and um, there was another comment here. Um, lockdown browser crashed for me yesterday, and the webcam didn't work. I had to restart my laptop, and and uh, that's I think a good. So lockdown browser is not perfect. Um, I certainly, when I was doing my tests uh, just this week, um, I happen to have two monitors uh, hooked up, and the second monitor actually created a problem where I had to, I that I was basically had a both monitors were black and I couldn't get into anything because lockdown locked me out of the computer. So I had to, you, you had to force you know, my computer to shut down and restart. So that's why I mentioned in there, like if you happen to have a second monitor hooked up, it's just going to be easier for a number of reasons to unplug that. So that's one, I guess, tip with lockdown is, is uh, try to get the minimal configuration possible on your computer before you start lockdown. It's not perfect, but it is an effort we're making to try to keep things fair. Um, for 99% of the students, we don't have to worry about it. I could just give you this uh, exam, and um, and I could trust that it would it would be fine. But it's um, but it, you know to ensure that for those of you who are doing your due diligence, you're getting the same credit as maybe the very very small number of students who would take advantage of not being monitored. Um, then we unfortunately need this deterrent. And so I apologize for the problems of lockdown, but. Um, this is the only real option that ASU has given us. Um, uh, there's this thing called RP Now, but it only is for truly online courses. So um, for a handful of students, we can proctor via Zoom, but otherwise, once you go over a handful, then we have to do it over lockdown. So are there any other uh, administrative sort of questions or questions about how the timeline will work? How strict is the 12 minute uh, time for presentations. Is there any room to go over that mark? Well, I mean, I'm not gonna be uh, holding a stopwatch. Um, I will say that if I do notice that it's like bleeding into, there's this, you know, if it starts getting really, really long, I might not watch all of the presentations because again, to be fair for everyone else, um, it's part of the exercise is meant to try to make your argument concise and, um, and so to, to try to keep it within that 12. All right, uh, and there's no specific penalty like, oh, you went 12, 12, 15, so that's five points off or something like that. You know, don't worry about it. If you go a couple seconds over, you know, that, that could just be, you know, it's gonna take a second for everybody to deal with Zoom transitions. So don't, 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 don't re-record. If you're like, oh crap, we did the, we went 12.05, now we need to record this whole thing again. Uh, if there's some fuzziness at the edge. Under is great. Uh, there is no problem with under. So, you know, you have a 10 minute presentation. If it's complete, if you feel like you would check all those boxes on that rubric, if you feel like another student would watch your presentation and feel satisfied afterwards and you only did 10 minutes, there's no problem. No one ever complains about going under. Thank you. Any other questions? And just so you know, like the midterm review here, I just, the, the slides that follow here, um, so I, mean, I, I guess I can, I can just put, I'll put this up here, but um, everything that follows this slide is basically just um, the same sort of thing with the midterm. I've just taken the kind of greatest hit slides from all the presentations that came from the post midterm units and, um, and I've thrown them in there. Like these are the things that I think about when I'm creating the test. And, um, and then I just took the midterm review, which are all the pre-midterm units, I took those greatest hit slides and I put them at the back of this presentation. 
So that's all I have in this presentation. There is that sample final up there. And yeah, and so absolutely. So this is your opportunity. I don't have to do any of these slides. You guys have questions about anything else, just uh, we can cover those here. So um, go ahead. So for the midterm, I didn't have to take the second one because I did fine on the first run of it, right? Um, but people told me that the second one was like definitely more hard than their first one. Is it gonna be like that for this um, final two? I don't under like I don't think you would do this like that, but <laughs> is well, it gonna I mean, be harder the second time around? I mean, if they're in the in the number of people that there, there weren't that many people that took the um, the the second midterm um, and. I mean, both midterms are available for everyone to review. Uh, it was not my intention for the second one to be any harder. Um, sometimes it is difficult to come up with a perfectly balanced question. And I feel like sometimes the best questions come out the first one. But, and you're welcome to take a look at both the pre-midterm or the pre-take and the retake for the midterms and see what you think about the difficulty of each question. Um, that is what I, I intended to do for the final exam as well. So I am not putting any sort of like retake penalty. There's, it's, it's at least not intended. I, I you know, there's going to be variance because I can't quite perfectly match everything up because I want to make the exams different, but I do my best to balance them. And I know that, you know, it might not feel like, you know, maybe the expectation of the retake you know, maybe you expected to see exactly the same thing that was on the pre-take and it wasn't quite that way and it feels harder and maybe it is slightly harder, but uh, it, you know, I do my best. So I'm, it's, it's, it's the best that I can do and that's what I'm gonna try to do for the final as well. Okay, I understand, thank you. I just don't wanna mess my grade up because <laughs> um, it's fine, thank you. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I've, I've made, so in the ideal world, I would make both tests next to each other and then kind of randomize which questions are on which. And then that way, I'm sure there's no like order effect in making them. And I think that's actually kind of how I did the midterm exam. Um, for the final exam, I guess I just didn't make the final exam ahead of time um, uh, you know, quick enough. And so I made all of the final exam that's for this week and I haven't finished the retake one yet. And so I am making, you know, like I did one session and now I'm doing the other, but I can tell you what I've done is I've just copied the Word doc that I made for the pre-take that's for, um, for Thursday. And I'm now going through and I'm saying, okay, so question four, um, how can I build a question similar to question four with maybe a similar number of answers, a similar structure, maybe over similar content and similar difficulty? Because I'm, you know, it's like, it may be that my best questions might have come out first, and now I'm kind of at the bottom of the barrel and the questions I can come up with, but I will do my best. Um, I can't guarantee, but uh, that's my warning, I guess, is that I haven't made the retake yet, and I'm going to do my best, but it's not made. And once I make it, then I can like say, well, you know what, uh, this is actually pretty balanced or not. It's my intent to make it balanced. I don't know for sure yet, but you know, hopefully it will be. Okay. Do you recommend us to just go over our past midterms then, then like just for practice and things like that? I think that is an excellent um, strategy because um, the, I mean, the midterms were Scantron. Um, Canvas uh, gives me a few other options like matching that uh, I don't have on Scantron, but I kind of mimic that on Scantron because I can kind of like, I can put like a question or an answer bank and then have you match and stuff like that. So there's some slight differences. But and things like that. Um, I would say that like the stuff that I asked on the midterm, you can see a lot of those same questions will be imported, not the, exactly the same questions, but the same style of questions and same content, you definitely were going to see on the final. Um, and so definitely studying the midterms are a good idea. I put a sample final from the last spring when I, uh, the last time I taught this, that, you know, going over those would be good. Not all of those are multiple choice, but the ones that um, are not multiple choice, you could imagine me trying to come up with a way to, to cover that same content in a multiple choice way. Uh, William asked how many questions? Um, the, the um, I think there are, it's out of 35 points. And uh, the, so in, if you remember in the midterm, the, there's a, a small batch of questions up front were just about how to fill out the Scantron sheet. There's not that there, but I do have a small batch of questions on this midterm, which are making sure you've done all of the, um, all of the, the like showing your environment, showing your ID, showing your, 
um, your formula sheets to the camera. So there's a couple of those that are sort of like, you know, giveaway questions up front. And then um, it's, uh, and so those add to some of those 35 points. And it's 35 points, and that's basically, um, if it was a Scantron, you could think of it as a point per question, but, um, but that would include like matching questions. So if I have a matching question that has, um, you know, five things on the left and five things on the right, then every match is a point. So technically there's like maybe 22 questions, but there's a couple that are these like multi-part questions that are actually five point questions instead of one point questions. And I gave, yeah, the, um, the very similar to the midterm, I will give you the system archetypes as a quick reference. So you don't have to put that on your cheat sheet. Any other questions? content questions, format questions. I can also just start through this slides and if anything comes up as we go through, you can, uh, you can uh, mention it. Okay. All right, so, um, so I guess I'll just, um, uh, again, as questions come up, just put them in the chat, raise your hand, speak up whatever you'd like. Um, and this is just meant to kind of um, encourage you to ask questions. And so uh, in the, the rest of what follows here, it's just kind of, again, the greatest hits. And so at the beginning of each of these slides, I've put the learning outcomes. If you actually go to each module, like the unit E module, the first page in each module on Canvas is a page that has just these learning outcomes. So these are the things that I hoped that you took from this unit. And these are the things that I would then conceivably try to test over to sort of see how well you took those things. So, um, so these are the things that I kind of hoped you took from unit E, like stuff about delays, stuff about lookup tables, um, using units properly, um, you know, a familiarity with the SIR model, familiarity with the BAS model. These are things that I would kind of maybe, maybe make sure that, that, uh, that you go over. Um, lookup tables. Um, so these are um, a little more abstract. You know, they are alternatives for mathematical formulas. So instead of putting a number into a formula and getting an answer out, we put the number into a graph and we use the graph to get that answer out. In Insight Maker, they're called converters. So we've seen lookup tables all the way back from chapter one. So you should be familiar with how to read a lookup table, but when you would use a lookup table, um, you should probably be familiar with how this lookup table was used in the fishery example. So how it maps from uh, fish density on the x-axis to net regeneration on the y-axis. Um, you know, this idea that a lookup table is actually just a set of points with the x points being inputs, the y points being desired outputs, and the lookup table connecting between them. So make sure you kind of feel comfortable with how these lookup tables work. Um, so uh, you're, I'm not gonna ask you things specific to um, how to do things in VinSim or Insight Maker. I'll ask you more generic questions about lookup tables, um, but you should know things that you can make lookup tables which uh, are, which allow you to, sorry to put an annotate here, which allow you uh, maybe I'll annotate in PowerPoint instead. Down here. Oh, sorry. Here. So this idea that your lookup table might actually have as an input this um, uh, a shadow variable, which is time. So your lookup table either can have an input coming from time or coming from another variable is something that you should probably um, you know, know. How does that work? Like what does it mean to be a lookup table in time versus a lookup table in another variable? And uh, so likewise, so this is just, and just again, I copied these slides in. I'm not gonna ask you specific things about Insight Maker or VinSim, but this idea that a lookup table in whatever platform you're in can either be a lookup table with respect to time or it could be a lookup table with respect to other variables in the model. So there's like uh, examples where the time goes into variable input and rate, but you could also have a variable going in there as an input instead. 
uh, delays. So you should know about fixed delays. So before I get to that, are there any questions about lookup tables? Is lookup tables, their purpose, how they work, pretty clear? Okay. Delays, fixed versus smoothing delays. So, um, so know roughly what the difference between a fixed delay and a smoothing delay is. Um, I gave this example of um, cars here that are let out from an intersection as, as, a, as, a, as a stoplight turns from red to green. You can think of that as the stoplight turns from red to green at an instant. And it may be in an ideal world, all the cars would immediately um, be in the intersection and down the lane. But in reality, the cars in the front maybe take off uh, very quickly, but the cars behind them don't take it. So it ends up slowing down. You end up getting a accumulated rise in the intersection until eventually all the cars uh, that could be in there are in there. So there's this transient period. And so some cars get quicker access to the intersection than others. And the kind of average delay is characterized here by this smoothing delay. So it's not a, not a fixed delay for everybody. It's an average delay where some are faster and some are slower. And that's what gives this kind of um, smoothing effect here. Similar to a toilet, you flush the toilet and it's almost like the, the desired water level immediately goes to the top of the toilet, uh, but the actual water level, um, you know, it slowly rises. And so you end up, um, you end up, it's like the water that got into the bottom of the toilet is the, the water that got there the fastest, but then you have to wait on the water that gets to the top of it, you know, which is, and so the kind of the, the delay there is the average time it takes for any little unit of water to get into the tank. So that's what I mean by a smoothing delay. And we can view that as um, the, the difference and contrast that with a fixed delay where, um, which is kind of like these like conveyor belt type of things. If you know how many cars are at one part here and you assume they move at a constant velocity, then within say five seconds or five minutes or whatever, you're gonna have basically the exact same cars that were here over here. So if you were to this model, the number of cars exiting an intersection, that number of cars is just going to be a delayed version of the number of cars entering that intersection. So that's what we mean by a fixed delay. So if you know what the shape of it was at one point, you're going to know that uh, a, you know, a certain delay later, you see the exact same shape uh, coming out the other side. So are there questions then about these two types of delays, fixed delays and smoothing delays. If this example doesn't work for you, there's, I've given some other examples here, um, schooling behavior, oh, okay. Um, no, please feel free to ask questions even if we've passed it. Um, so, uh, so there's a question here, um, could we touch base again on what a lookup table's effect is on a model or what their purpose is? And uh, that's a great uh, question. And so the, the idea behind these lookup tables is that if I go back to say, um, so a model like this one up here, then the idea is that there's a variable here, which is called variable interest rate. And that interest rate provides the interest rate that is going to be used to calculate how much interest gets added to the bank account. And it might be that we have a simple formula so that uh, over time, then we get a, um, a certain number of, uh, we, get, you know, we, we say that, well, in January, the interest is this and, um, and it follows some sort of curve so that the interest is highest in, uh, in the summer and then comes back towards the January number in the winter and then it ends up getting back to the January number. And if you knew exactly what that curve looked like and you could specify it mathematically, then you could go into this variable interest rate and write a mathematical formula that if you were to plot that mathematical formula would look like a curve with time on one axis and the output on the other axis and the interest rate on the other axis. But sometimes, we don't have a mathematical formula. All we know is that in January, the interest was this. In February, the interest was something else. In March, the interest was something else. And so we don't have a mathematical pattern. We just know that this, this, was, this is the pattern we want, even though we can't describe it with a formula. So if you can draw it, so it might be that I draw 
and I say, well, I know it uh, over time, so I'll put time on this axis. I want my interest rates, so maybe I'll put I for interest rate on this axis. I want it to kind of look like this. In January, it's this, and then it comes down, and you know, it has some pattern to it. And I want it to be shaped like this, but I don't have a good formula for that. Well, rather than trying to come up with a mathematical formula that approximates that, we just draw exactly this, and that's what goes into the lookup table. It's just a way of us um, not using a mathematical formula, us just using data. So some of you um, have models that are simulating um, uh, things that go, things are consequences of COVID-19 in your final projects. And so some of you actually wanted to use real data from the number of people who were infected in a particular area. And so you went out and you actually downloaded data or you, you captured data on the number of infections per day. So rather than trying to build an SAR model that simulated that number of infections per day, you just got the raw data in. And you just wanted to generate that many infections per day. And so you use the lookup table in order to do that. And you could say on Sunday with this many infections, on Monday with this many infections, and so on and so forth. So a lookup table just gives us an alternative to a formula when it's easier to draw the relationship as opposed to write it out as a formula. Does that help, Brandy? So when you say draw it, are you meaning like when you go into the lookup table and you can say like as a graph and then you can like put little points on the graph? Is that what you mean by drawing it without an equation? That's right, right. So um, if we didn't select lookup table, we might write like, um, you know, X times uh, five plus Y. And um, that's supposed to be a five. And so this would be our alternative to a lookup table. We have a variable where X and Y are coming into that variable and we're going to multiply X by five and then add it, shift it up by Y. Um, and that might be that we have a reason to believe that that's the right formula to use. Now we might not know what the right formula is, but we might know that, you know, actually if we plot out X on one axis, we know that whenever X is small, we want this output, and I'll call this output Z, we want this output to be small, but then when X hits a critical amount, we want the output of Z to get large again, and then maybe it'll smoothly get small and then get large again, and then come down and be small again. And so we now have a relationship that we can draw graphically, but we can't really figure out a nice tidy formula like this one. So instead of using a formula, we just draw the graph in that as graph in the lookup table. And then VinSim will then use the lookup table instead of a mathematical formula. Oh, okay. I got it. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions about that, about lookup tables? Great, okay. So I'll head back to delays. So these are some example of fixed delays. So um, I would highlight material flow and transit delays. I already mentioned uh, cars moving a constant velocity are going to typically be modeled by a fixed delay. You know how many entered the transportation sector um, uh, segment. And so you know uh, that uh, after a certain fixed amount of time, those ones will exit the segment. And assuming that nobody else, nothing else happened on the midway, then you kind of assume their formation doesn't change. So that is what we might refer to as a schooling behavior, like a school of fish. And so if you know how big the school is and what shape it is when it entered some water column or something like that, then, um, then you might know that as they exit uh, that, then they're gonna take roughly the same shape. And so we just need to know how long that, uh, that, that transport segment was. Um, age structure and population. That's another one that I would say is, is clearly, it's a very commonly a fixed delay. Everyone enters first grade. It takes them about nine months to complete first grade. And except you know, there might be a couple of exceptions, but generally everyone who completes first grade goes on to second grade. So if you had 150 students in first grade, next year you're gonna have 150 students in second grade. The year after that, you're gonna have 150 students in third grade. So this age structure has a fixed delay. So if you knew what the value was in one variable, you know what the value is going to be in another variable at some delay later. And so that's what we refer to these cohorts. Um, so those are our fixed delays. And you can contrast that with smoothing delays, which are like we, we mentioned the food entering the stomach. 
is that you get a bunch of food enters the stomach at some instant, but the nutrients enter the bloodstream. Some nutrients get in quick, other nutrients takes a longer time. So even though the food all got there at the same time, the food is broken down at different rates. And so the outside of the food might get broken down faster than the inside of the food. So we can then say, well, on average, a lump of food of this volume is going to take this long to digest on average, which means that some of it's gonna be left over after that average. Some will be digested much sooner than that average. And so that's why the nutrients entering the bloodstream um, might end up having, even though the food entered at a particular time, this is where we got the entire chunk in the stomach, the actual nutrients entering the bloodstream might slowly enter the bloodstream. And likewise, when that chunk disappears, then because of the delay of the nutrients getting through the processes that are going on in the stomach, then there might still be nutrients in the pipeline and we have to wait for those nutrients to get out of the pipeline. And that's why even though nutrients are exiting the bloodstream, a few are still entering because they were stuck in that pipeline. So that's why these smoothing delays, the inputs are sharp, but the outputs have these smooth edges and that's why we call them smoothing delays. That's all I'm kind of saying right here. And so I use the toilet as another example of that. And so you can view the delay as like an inertia or a sluggishness of the system. So I've heard a lot of people talk about COVID-19 and talking about not knowing um, what's going to happen when, uh, when restrictions, when everyone is allowed to start mingling again. And, um, and the suggestion is that, well, there's probably a lot of people who won't just go out and resume things as they, they were because there's inertia. I've heard that, that word is used a lot is because there's, there's gonna be inertia in the system. It's going to take a large force. Um, so people will either very slowly enter or they'll need a lot of confidence that it's safe to, to re-enter. And so there, of course, there's gonna be some people who jump right out there. They're gonna start bowling tomorrow if you let them but there's gonna be others that are gonna be very cautious and we'll touch a bowling ball for the next six months. And so we can say on average, how long does it take for people to bowl again? Um, but, uh, but then likewise, it took, it took um, something like COVID-19 to get people to massively change their consumption habits. So they had a huge inertia and it took a huge force in order to get a fast change. So, um, so this is this delay corresponds to the inertia in the system, which you can view as the force it takes to get people to make a change. So a large delay means you need a huge force to get people to change quickly. So, um, so that's other things you can model with that. And along with that, then we had this term uh, step response, which uh, basically means if you ask a system to change at some instant, and then you watch um, then how it changes, then the delay, this average delay, corresponds to the point at which the system achieves 63% of the desired change. So if you um, were to ask, um, uh, so how long does it take before people resume their normal lives after the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted, uh, then you might find it takes three months for 63% of the people to go back to normal. And so then it's gonna take an additional however many months for things to actually get back to normal. If we were to then to model that in a system dynamics model of what happens as things get uh, limited, then we might use a smoothing delay where we use our time constant of that three months. So the time it took for those people to then um, for 63% of the total population to come back, that ends up being the parameter that we put into our smoothing delay. And we get that from a so-called step response where you force a change and you see how quickly it changes. Um, is that 63.2 like a magic number or is it just when any time it makes like a, a step, like a step uh, yes. formation? Yeah, where does this 63.2 come from? Well, when we have um, one of these, so it turns out that the um, the formula, so when you have one of these, so this is what, there's apparent, there's, if you get to more advanced classes, you'll find out that there are a, a wide variety of smoothing delays. And so this is what I'm showing you here is a so-called first order smoothing delay. And a first order smoothing delay always has the mathematical form of a constant, 
times one minus e to the minus, and then there's some um, time divided by our time constant. And this a that's in front basically corresponds to whatever the value is that things settle out at. So in this case, a is equal to one. And it, the 63% value um, corresponds to this fraction. So when this is 63% here, this one minus e to the minus t over, uh, over capital T, when t is equal to capital T. And so if you got it, went into your calculator and you did e, Euler's number, to the negative one, and then you did one minus that, then you would get 63.2%. So that's where this magic 63.2% comes from. It's because the type of smoothing delay that we use as a, as a first order approximation for these types of delays takes this mathematical form. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, it does. I probably won't go to like higher <laughs> math classes, but here for this final, we're gonna need to know like these formulas by heart, like point amount. I would say, I would say that um, know that the average delay is what we use to characterize a smoothing delay, mm -hmm. and it's um and it's probably a good idea to remember that there is this fancy number uh, that's about sixty three percent. So 63% of the rise corresponds to the average delay uh, of, a, of a smoothing, of a, of a smoothed output, of a smooth step response. So that's, I think, you don't need to, none of this, this is all bonus info that I put over here, this formula over here, don't worry about that. But the 63%, I would have that in the back of your mind or on a cheat sheet somewhere. And this time constant, um, that that's the term for this delay. This 2.5 seconds is the so-called time constant. Yeah, I didn't remember going over that, so there's no information to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a um, a question: Are there recommended math courses after SOS 212? Um, the the um, and I'll get to Brandy's question here in a second. So uh, the the so tech, I think in the Bachelors of Science of Sustainability, there's none of the rest of our courses actually require 212 as a prereq. You just have to take 212 as part of the BS. Um, certainly, if you were to take courses that have dynamical systems in them um, or real analysis, if you really want to get advanced, you look for courses that have the words real analysis in them. And that's all this stuff fits into the so-called real analysis. Um, any other courses that relate to calculus would relate to this course or dynamical systems. So the word dynamics uh, or dynamical, um, th those would be the things that would naturally follow from this course. Brandy asked, um, so 63% uh, is the average of a 2.5 second in a smoothing delay. So the um, 2.5 in this particular example here, um, 2.5 is the average delay for, a, for this particular smoothed response. And so you can view this as like, um, as you, if you were to think of this, this hill that's 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 climbing up here if you were to think of this um this particular hill here as kind of having um some elements of the if this is water filling a toilet then this is the water that comes into the toilet first and this is the water that's coming into the toilet last and so the water that comes into the toilet last has to wait the longest in order to get into the toilet. The water that comes into the toilet first gets there immediately. If we were to then ask all of the tiny little volumes of water in the toilet, how long did it take you to get into the toilet? And then take the average across that population, the average would be 2.5. So it is the average time that all of the water has to wait to get into the toilet, with some getting in immediately and some having to wait 10 seconds to get into the toilet. And it just so happens that that average happens to correspond to, um, the, to you know, the, the volume of water that happens to enter the toilet when the toilet is at 63% of its final rise. 
that volume of water happens to arrive at the average time. So it's just a nice mathematical convenience that 63% of the rise happens to be the average. And that's just the magic of exponentials. Does that help, Brandy? Yeah, it does. So, it, but you said we needed to remember 63%. So is it that that happens like that in other times? Or is it like three the most common number that that usually happens at? The, the time constant or the thing that you put into the smoothing delay. So if you were to go into VinSim or Insight Maker and type smooth, and then you have to give it a delay, that delay is the time that corresponds to 63% of the total change. So if you were to ask for an instantaneous change, that instantaneous change wouldn't happen. Um, and so then you'd say, well, then how long is it going to take for me to get there? So if I ask it to instantaneously jump to a particular level, say one, then, um, then the question is, how long is it going to take to one? Well, we, instead we ask, how long does it take to get to 63% of the total value? And the amount of time it takes for you to wait to get to 63% of the total value is the average that you put in to the smoothing delay. Okay, cool. Got it. Okay, great. So likewise, when your toilet example, um, uh, if you actually took a stopwatch to your toilet, you could go into a toilet and then mark on the side of the toilet what 63% of the 15 centimeters is. You could say, well, all right, so 63% um, so of 15 centimeters is 9.45 centimeters. So you go into the toilet and mark 9.45 centimeters, flush the toilet, and then use a stopwatch and see how long does it take to get to 9.45 centimeters. That time is the time then you go in to VinSim or Insight Maker and you put that in for your smoothing delay. And you've just built a model of the toilet. Okay. And so, yeah, the time constant is the term that we typically use for these systems. All right. So, and this is the, exactly the toilet example here. So if this toilet example, if this was 15 up here, um, then we know that 63% um, is, happens around here, which would be like 9.45. If I did that, if I remember what I just did, I just uh, did 63% uh, of 15 is about 9.48. So let's say this is 9.48 then um, I could, from there, I could say, all right, if this was the actual toilet water rise, I could say that the toilet hit 9.48 around three seconds, and I started, and I flushed the toilet at one second. So there is a two second time constant of this system. That's how I read that graph. All right. So any questions about that? The two second time. That, so that's what would go in those little question marks in the delay bubble. You got it. That's the two second would go there. Fantastic. Um, question. Um, I never really quite understood the toilet example. I know that was like a long time ago, but if there's time later, can you explain the dynamics of the toilet model thing? Uh, yeah, you. Oh, you mean like the actual stock and flow model and like how, how all that works? Yeah, if that's going to be helpful. If not, then it's cool. But I never, like, I always tried to go back to that homework, but never understood it. Gotcha. Um, well, how about this? Because it's, it's very, so I'm, I just opened up the um, participant list so I can see the, how many people would like me to just cut to the basic um, feedback model to look at that toilet example to make sure we understand how all the feedbacks work in that system. Um, you can vote in the participant list at the bottom with a yes and a no. And if there's a bunch of yeses, I can cut to it. If there's, um, if there's not really a lot of people voting for that, then um, I can take this question offline or see if we have time for it later. So right now it looks like, go ahead. I'll just um, look at it on my own time probably. All right, well, feel free to, uh, I'm happy to, to, again, talk offline. It doesn't happen to be, have to be during, um, you know, this class period. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. 
So, um, so this uh, here, I'm just, I'm just cutting through those old slides. And uh, just this is just a reminder of where all this smoothing and averaging comes from. So I'm just going to kind of go through this quickly because this is all the slides that have just been copied directly out of, um, of those previous uh, lectures. And so I've already kind of said all of this stuff, but uh, so just I probably didn't need to include all of these slides in this um, overview. So just kind of cutting ahead to get out of this. So that's smoothing, uh, smoothing delays, and those are fixed delays. So, and there is, uh, this is effectively the toilet model right here, where the, um, the flow into the toilet is just the um, input, which is the target water level, minus the actual water level, divided by the time constant of the toilet system, which might be two seconds. Did I have an example of fixed delays um, in this PowerPoint? I, I did. It was um, a, the, that was back in the car example. I said a tail of um, two delays, and the fixed delay, which is graphed kind of down here, is the example where your input comes early, and then the output comes looks exactly like the input. It's not smooth in any way, but it's just shifted over. So in the smoothing delay, the input, it looks like a big square and the output starts exactly when the input starts, it just responds sluggishly. In the fixed delay case, the input looks like this and the output looks exactly like it, but it's shifted over. Okay, great. So I'll go back to where we left off. So any other questions about fixed and smoothing delays? Oh, and uh, was there another question here? Would that graph be a one second delay? Um, I think in that fixed delay graph, uh, I thought it was like, I think I made it five in that particular graph. Um, or maybe I made it, uh, so in this graph here, the delay is between one and 11. So there's actually a 10 second delay between this, uh, this one here. Whereas this delay over here looks like it's, um, this time constant looks like it's one, two, looks like about three. So it looks like there's three seconds in this direction and 10 seconds in that direction. Oh yeah, one second is how long it takes to, for this action. My little test action only took one second, but it took 10 seconds for that test action to be felt by the output system. So if I would have drawn a different shape here, then I would have seen that different shape over here looked exactly like the previous shape, but just shifted over 10 seconds. Okay. All right. So let's then uh, move on to the topic of epidemic dynamics. Um, so I made some uh, updates to these slides in the, uh, the original lecture in uh, E3, which um, I don't know if, um, so those updates might not be in this one, but we come over about the same stuff. So basically I would say that um, uh, be roughly familiar with the SIR model. Um, so that, you know, there are these three compartments, uh, S, infectious and recovered, susceptible, re infectious, recovered. Um, no, um, basically the, you know, the, it, like it looks like a lot here, but there's just the, the basic processes, like the only way to get from infectious to recovered is by going through a recovery and recovery only depends upon the number of infectious. So every infectious person takes this long and this is a smoothing delay. Every infectious person takes on average this amount of time to recover. And so you can view this as one of those 63.2% times. So if the entire population was immediately infected, then um, after you waited this amount of time, 63% of them would be recovered and the remaining um, whatever 30 some percent uh, would end up still be infectious um, at that, you know, if you only waited this amount of time. And so that, um, you know, goes into this recovery block and a lot of our focus has been on the SI block. Um, and, so, um, and so this is basically what I just walked through in these steps. So in the infectious to recovered block, this is me just saying this, this duration of infection, this is like that time constant, but it's in terms of um, epidemic dynamics and not toilets. 
And so we just say that every infected person takes an average of this time to recover. And so our formula is just going to be the infected people divided by that uh, duration of time. And, um, and if you wanted to view this as a toilet example or something like that, you can kind of view this as saying, well, imagine there was a minus zero up top here and this um, went all the way over here. Then I see your hand here in a second, I'll get the, the Brandy. So you can view this um, infected population as kind of an input and um, as you know, so you immediately get this many in the infected population and you can view the zero right now as kind of the, um, the this is sort of like the, the current water level. So this is like the initial um, number. You could view this maybe as the like, um, this isn't quite the best example uh, that I could give here, but, um, but you could view this as a little bit like an initial, uh, well, it's, well, I'm gonna keep going with this example. You can kind of view this as the input that kind of jumps up, you get this many infected people, and you're wondering, well, what is the recovered population going to look like? And you can view this step input infected people, if you view the number of recovered people, it's probably going to look, you know, like a, more of a smoothing curve. They're gonna gradually come in until eventually you have as many recovered as you originally had infected. And so that's kind of what you're seeing coming out here. And that's what I'm sort of trying to depict here. It's kind of like the toilet example here, when in reality, um, this is, um, the, it's actually more like we're modeling the infected population as how it decays over time. So it's gonna start at some initial infected number. And it's almost as if, we our input is um, is our desired number of infected people is zero, and so given that, how many um, how long does it take for the infected population to reach sixty three percent of the descent to zero? Well, that is the duration of infection. So this is an example of how these this IR process is actually in behind the scenes implementing a smoothing delay, even though we didn't call it a smoothing delay in class then we see a lot of the same formulas come up. And so you can definitely tell that people in their mind are picturing this as being a smoothing process. So Brandy, you had a question about this SIR stuff? Yeah, I just had a question about the equation that you showed us on the very first slide. It said recoveries equals infection, infectious population or infection, pop, infected population, but then times one recovery divided by person over uh, duration of infection what the divided by per person per day so that per person is just how many people had it at that time <clears throat> or the uh, uh, uh well the this is uh kind of just meant to be uh for units and so we're saying that um oh no i didn't mean to say that that per day is not not meant to be there so this is this is saying how long does it take one person to um recover so it says, well, we get one recovery per person after we wait this duration of time. So this is just kind of bookkeeping on all of our units. And so because the infected population is already in terms of people, then when you multiply this thing through, then the people here is gonna cancel with the people there. And so that in the end, this is just gonna end up becoming recoveries per day, which is the unit that we want for this flow. Got it. Okay. All right, so that's kind of the easy formula and there's a negative feedback loop and the negative feedback loop is that um, as you get more and more recoveries, you get less and less infected people and so you get less of recoveries over time. So there is a negative feedback loop that's associated with the SIR model, at least one. So the full SIR model um, you know, that uh, involves the SI population as well. And, um, and we talked about in the book how you can implement a lookup table here to change the contact rate. And you can say that we've got a certain contact rate when people reach a different level of infections. And so we talked about how um, that ends up uh, changing the, if you plot the infected population for a different 
time. So you either you have the kind of no strategy or you have the we're going to implement quarantine strategies when we hit 2000 infections or we're going to implement quarantine strategies when we hit 1000 infections. Then what we end up seeing is that in the this is our infection peak under no infections. If we wait a little bit of time and then start quarantining, then it, it blunts the infection peak, but it makes it last longer. And then if we implement a quarantine very early, then it really blunts the infection peak, but it lasts, um, but it lasts a whole lot longer. And so this is the flattening the curve that everybody talks about so that if, you, um, if your hospitals can only support this many patients, then you would like to quarantine. So you push this infection peak down so that no instant of time, you have too many patients for hospitals to take. So in the end, you're not actually changing the number of, you're not changing much the number of infections that, um, that, so the affected population doesn't actually change that much from quarantine policy to quarantine policy, unless you, you gotta quarantine real early. You gotta be like New Zealand and like quarantine immediately in order to make a difference on how many people are affected by the disease. Um, and so otherwise, you're not really changing how many people are affected by the disease, you're just stretching out the infections so that when you do get an infection, it is more likely that there will be people available to help um, service that infection and, and get people through the infection. So this is one of the things we can experiment with. Something, a takeaway message that, that I would give you here is that this, um, the math, in pure mathematical models, it is easy to solve for these steady state solutions. So I'll say, I'll just do ST, ST, steady state. So it is easy to solve for these things in those purely mathematical models, but it is harder to figure out these so-called transient states, like exactly what's going on in the short run. So in other words, these peaks here, the shape of these peaks are difficult to see in a purely mathematical model. So one of the advantages of simulation is they allow us to see these transient characteristics because like in the case of COVID, we actually don't care so much about how many people survive. I mean, we do care, but we want a lot of people to survive. But what is really important for policy is how we get there. And so what's important for policy is how many people are infected at any given time. And that is not a long-term phenomenon. And long-term phenomena, that's really good for mathematics. That's much easier for math to handle. For the short-term phenomena of how bad do things get during a transient period, that's harder for the math to solve, but it is easy for the simulations to solve. And that's uh, what we're seeing here, is that this is something that comes out of the simulations very readily. And then it really shows us that as we quarantine, we um, flatten the curve. That's exactly what we're just seeing. And we, that flattening the curve comes from simulation studies. So that's our kind of epidemic uh, dynamics there. So are there any questions about these epidemic dynamics? You might go back through and just review, um, you know, where the formulas for each one of these things comes from and see if you're comfortable with those formulas. Are you going to ask us specifically about the formulas of the epidemic model? Um, I would say that um, I, uh, I, I won't give you the entire SIR model and say fill in all the formulas, uh, but I think it would be fair game for um, me to say, um, you know, how, how does infectivity affect infections? So we would kind of expect that <laughs> the infectivity is, if, if you get more infectivity, you're gonna get more infections. And so we would kind of expect that this formula is gonna be the product of the number of contacts, dangerous contacts per day times the infectivity. And so being able to look at uh, something like this, and if you were to focus on just one of these and then look at a bunch of options, for what formulas might go in there, then I'd want you to be able to sort of say, yeah, it's most likely this formula and not this formula. Also, just generally knowing, like I'm about to talk about the BAS model, mm -hmm. knowing the relationship between, say, advertising and infection 
um, you know, that might be an important thing because those are effectively, as far as the math is concerned, they're identical. Like, you know, infecting a population in the BAS model, they just basically expanded this portion and they said, we're going to put money into infecting a population with an interest in our product. Whereas here, we're just saying, we don't know how it gets there, but there is some infectivity that gets into it, but it's basically all word of mouth. And so actually in this model, there's no inoculation. This is like the BAS model that's only word of mouth. You need a separate infectious, you know, you need to have a way to get the initial infected into there. And that's what the BAS model does with advertising. So being able to recognize the similarities and differences between the SIR model and the BAS model, I think is probably a good thing to know. Okay, is that is that back from E6 or the lecture? I can't remember. The BAS model, that um, that is in, the BAS model is in E4. Okay. So that was the, um, the next thing that I was getting into here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about the epidemic dynamics? So just, I just go ahead about um you're saying advertising is the component of the bass model that infects people but then in the other one you said that there was really only the infectivity uh variable that was affecting the sri model but then or but actually i don't know what my question is never mind well so i i yeah i, I made a hiccup initially um is that so the infectivity is so if i was to uh, drill down a little bit farther. So, um, so this is the BAS model without advertising. And this is basically the SI part of the SIR model. So this would keep going going and then there would be an R over here. Um, but so in the BAS model here, then um, the way you get from susceptible to infectious is a susceptible has to bump into an adopted or an adopter and then that adopter has to tell the susceptible how great the product is. And the adoption fraction is like the infectivity in the SIR model. That's how convincing you are by telling them that my phone is really good. Now, what Bass realized is that he also needed to add advertising into it. So the full Bass model um, has an advertising loop, um, which um, I'm trying to see if I've got in if I've got in here, which um, I don't know if I have the full BAS model in these review slides, but if you were to go back and look at the advertising loop basically adds an additional process um, that enhances the adoption rate with an investment in advertising. So basically there um, is uh, some variables down here, which basically make it so that um, you're, there's a certain number of money that you can put in to advertising, which is captured in this variable. And that amount of money will then, um, you know, you spend that amount of money per susceptible, and that will get some of them to spontaneously become infected, even without contact with an infected one. And so that, um, this idea that advertising, like what would advertising's role be in the SIR model, it would be like someone without you bumping into an infected individual, um, infecting you like, you know, with a, you know, something that they took out of a laboratory. So that's really what advertising dollars are. Is there a way to get you into the adopter camp even without bumping into an adopter? So like airborne, I already put it in the chat, but so like airborne infection would be like, like if somebody could just walk into a room and be infected by like the air because there's leftover germies. That's an excellent question. So airborne infection actually is still a word of mouth, but it enhances the contact rate. So if you have something that requires touching someone, then you have to ask, how many people do I touch every day? How many hands do I shake? And then that, if you say like, all right, I shake six hands per day, then I'd say the contact rate is gonna be six per day. But if now I have an airborne disease, then I have to say, how many people do I share the air with per day? And that might be 30 people. So now I have um, a contact rate of 30 per day. So I would still say airborne infection is an example of word of mouth. Um, so where you have this, um, this contact rate is what's being enhanced there. So the, um, 
advertising in an SIR model would be like the jump so we all we call it a novel coronavirus. And so the word novel comes from the fact that it is a virus that has not been spread around humans yet. So it was actually transferred from a non-human. So it was transferred from an animal to get into a human. And that's what makes it a novel coronavirus. And that is like the advertising step. It's like, um, so it's, it's as if um, I came up with an idea like, um, you know, gee, I'm gonna put coffee into a mug. I just came up with that idea on my own. Now somebody sees me drinking coffee out of a mug and they think that's a good idea and they start doing it. So that second part is the word of mouth. But that initial, gee, how did I come up with the idea of putting coffee into a mug? Well, the advertising is what kind of gave me that idea. Um, if I, you know, it, in a way you can think of advertising as kind of uh, is extending word of mouth. But the, the thing about advertising is that you can advertise even if you have no adopters. Your adopters could be equal to zero and you could still get people to adopt. And that's why we think of it as kind of a spontaneous infection as opposed to an infection you get from someone else. At the instant you're getting it from someone else, it's kind of fits in this word of mouth loop. Any other questions about that? Just trying to make analogies between the BAS model and the SIR model, because they are identical in the mathematical sense, except the BAS model adds this advertising loop, which unfortunately I don't have in the slides that I sampled from. And I actually have that analogy here on this slide. So the infectivity is like the adoption traction and total contacts per day is the contact rate. All right. All right. So it is. Um, so the only, I guess, the uh, since we only have two minutes uh, left in regulation time here, um, I guess uh, the only the other new content that we covered post midterm was um, was these kind of more abstract concepts like tipping points um, and. Um, chaos and randomness. And so, uh, and then along with tipping point to make it a little more concrete, um, for a natural resources example, we talked about maximum sustainable yield, MSY, and how that relates to tipping points. So I would brush up on, um, you know, what is the difference between chaos and randomness? I would just kind of know that at the definitional level. But then I would know a little bit more deeply, what is a tipping point? And if um, I need a concrete example, if I'm thinking in the fisheries example, then how did a tipping point relate to the kind of maximum sustainable yield in that fisheries example? And how did that affect, um, you know, how we think about how many boats to add to the fishery? And so I wanna make sure I give people enough time for any additional questions on those. So it's 414, so technically we only have a minute left. Are there any questions related to um, these, this stuff here. Oh, and I also uh, make sure you know about um, this building confidence in models. So boundary adequacy, structural adequacy, uh, dimensional verification, um, knowing you know, what those are for, um, knowing um, what about um, this transitional object interpretation that we build models in order to update our mental models. We build a physical model that we can experiment with and to change the way our mental model works. And so we're transitioning our mental models. Uh, Brandy, you raised a hand. Is there any way that you could upload like a video of you talking about, like how you just explained the other things, talking about these concepts to Canvas? Uh, well, I mean, I have the, I have all the lecture videos from before that are uploaded. In a couple of cases, like the chaos and randomness and a couple other lectures, there are accessory videos that are already within the units. I probably won't be recording any other videos between now and Thursday, um, but, uh, but hopefully if you can review those other videos that are already up there, then, then that hopefully will be helpful. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? For those small handful of you who haven't um, completed that, um, Lockdown browser, please make sure you do that um, before Thursday, um, preferably today, so that I can make sure that everybody's got into there.
And uh, and then there was a um, a private message about can uh, can groups come to office hours? And sure, you can. Um, you come to office hours, you'll all be in the waiting room. And then if I admit one of you and you say, actually, I wanted my whole group to be in here, I could admit all of you. And so your group can come to office hours if you'd like to ask questions about your final project. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? It is Tuesday, and so I do have office hours today at 4.30 in my office hours room. So for so now, I'd say, go ahead. Sorry, to reiterate, um, best studying strategy for the final, just to go over um, that um, last final that you did last year, and then our past midterms, and hopefully we'll be fine, right? Uh, I would say if you need to prioritize, start there. Um, I can't guarantee that everything I talked about, everything I asked on the last year's final, I'm going to reuse or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But those would be good places to start. I would say if you feel confident about last year's final, and you still feel confident about, like I, I actually have blank midterms from this year. If you were to like retake that midterm and feel pretty confident about it, then you're probably in pretty good shape. Um, but uh, I certainly would recommend you looking through the learning outcomes for all the units and in each one of these bullets, just sort of say, how well can I do this bullet? And if you feel like you're ticking off all these bullets, then you're probably in pretty good shape. Okay, and we can't have a copy of our past test midterm, whatever. Um, the, well, we you, have, have, uh, you have all your, your answers for that already. So okay. um, that's posted, there's like, if you go back to the midterm module, there's, it's anonymized, you look at the last four digits, and you should be able to find all of your answers and see how well you did on each question. I remember, it's just been a long time, sorry. Sure. Well, uh, I don't want to keep anybody else any further, so feel free to pop off here. I'll hang around here um, at, uh, until either everybody's gone or 4.30, and then I'll switch over to office hours at 4.30. Oh, and uh, the, there's um, course evaluations are also due on Friday. I'll send out a note. And so uh, we always have a low response rate. So it's nice to get that feedback back. Uh, so uh, my director of the school ends up seeing those. And um, so it's good feedback for me and for him to see how well we're doing. Oh, yeah, sorry. Don't worry about attendance today. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I I'm sure I could find it, but there's so many slides. I'm not worried about it. I'll just, I'll just uh, excuse the apps or the attendance for today. Sorry about that. Okay, not seeing any other questions. Gradually people are ticking off. um office hours are in this room later at 4 30. they're in the office hours room so oh. that's the you can find it on canvas thank you bye mm -hmm. all right looks like everybody is heading out so i am going to stop the recording and close the room <laughs>